Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Pact. I'm the P, Peter Coffin. This is the ACD, Ms. Astronaut Cowboy Doctor, Master of Science. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and your favorite podcast service. Also, leave us a glowing review on Audible and Apple Podcasts. We are a five-star podcast. Not three, not four, five. I'm a five-star man. <laughs> Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash packpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Your monthly support gets you into the Discord server, gets you exclusive content, and you see some content before other people do. We've got fantastic pack merch as well. Finally, most importantly, tell your friends we rely so big on word of mouth. We stream 7 p.m. Eastern on Saturdays. Thank you very much for tuning in. So last week we talked about patriotism and not patriotism as in loving the U.S. state, but patriotism for the proletariat. We drew a bunch of explicit distinctions between the proletariat and the state in every country and talked about how it is good to love the people around you, the place you're from, and have some pride in your fellow Americans. And how that is diametrically opposed to nationalism, which is a love for the nation state and a socio-political groundwork for fascism. We know that fascism is capitalism in crisis, but when you have sentiments among the populace that are in favor of the imperial core um, and the actions of the state, um, that supports the actions of the bourgeoisie that is not the same thing and is in fact quite antagonistic towards the idea of patriotism which is loving your fellow countrymen wanting the best for them and in the case of the united states as the imperial core directly against what the u.s state has done throughout its history um, for the people living in its land we used a few examples mao talking about how um, undermining the imperialist states of, say, Germany helps the proletariat of Germany. We used an example from Lenin talking about essentially the same thing. If you want the best for your country, you have to want to undermine the state of the country, the ruling class of the country, which rules over all other people. Patriotism by necessity is against the bourgeois state. I, we actually got a pretty good response on the episode. People, yeah. people were pretty uh, receptive towards it. But there are still opponents of this worldview who are coming in the form of like your settlers, people, your third worldists who believe that somehow the U.S. proletariat represents an exception to Marx and Engels analysis, that somehow they are the beneficiaries of imperialism. Again, just a form of um, American exceptionalism. Exactly. In, in disguise of being... Uh, woke and I guess maybe Maoist or third worldist or maybe just 15 years old and on the internet. How convenient! It is. Advocates for working class interests um, think that they shouldn't work together and that that's bad and they shouldn't be united by a common underlying sentiment to advocate for themselves as a group of people living in the same place. How convenient for capital to say Oh yeah, that's not good. That's that, that's racist. You're really uh hurting your Americans of color there. Um, by Americans of color. By, by AOC. <laughs> you're really hurting your AOCs by um helping them and, and wanting to have a strong base for their advocacy. Um, that's not good. That's not um, it's not a good look. Yikes. Yikes. It, it's like a, a reverse. What they're saying is the cause. It's the psychological wage um, that was given to white slaves, white indentured servants to make them think that they were better. This was used to divide the slave and servant class through race. They're basically just doing that, yeah. but saying that it's advocacy on behalf of the more marginalized folks in that group and people of color in the United States. In this case, they're doing the same thing that Donald Trump did when he turned the rural white working class against immigrants south of the border. They're just saying that this is good for those immigrants. It kind of is an extension of PMC are the real enemy. 
except for it takes it and makes it about the American proletariat or alternatively, it racializes it and makes it about the white proletariat. People saying it have accepted the neoliberal zero sum framing that pro groups have to compete with each other for who gets their needs addressed. That is exactly what Donald Trump did when calling people south of the border coming in murderers, rapists, they're not sending their best, um, and turned the white American low-income worker against those people be- with the notion that these groups have to compete with each other. And these people are doing the same fucking thing under the guise of being woke and, and at a-, a broader scope, at an international proletarian scope. And see, that's the trick, though, isn't it? It's not really about who is good and who is bad. It's about having people think of the other group as bad and themselves as good. doesn't really matter what their views are. And what the direction yeah. of that dynamic is. Yeah, just that it's happening. Yep. The issue that arises out of all this is the idea, though, that somehow the interests of the American proletariat are aligned with the U.S. state that they are the beneficiaries of imperialism worldwide and that they have no reason to consider themselves similar or to have things in common with the international proletariat because they have refrigerators, because they have washing machines and dishwashers. These things, they make it so that, I mean, they make life perfect, right? Nothing could be better as long as like you don't actually have to do your dishes, right? Yeah. Like, let's say instead of having to take your laundry down to the creek, the creek. You, you put it in a machine. That means your life's perfect. It, it is a good luxury. Nobody say, and it's a luxury that yeah. when you're comparing the average worker, don't have in other places. Absolutely. Um, that does not mean that the worker in America is aligned with the interest of the imperial core. Yeah. Indoor appliances, plumbing. These things are singular benefits of living in the Imperial Corps that aren't exclusive to the Imperial Corps. They're singular benefits. Does that make the working class the beneficiary? Does that make their interests align with the bourgeoisie of this country? Fuck no. Yeah, and I I even see in like more nuanced takes, like it doesn't necessarily mean that their interests are aligned with the Imperial Corps but they still benefit in the form of material sequelae that they happen to have, like refrigerators, dishwashers, whatever. Even then, though, in the long term, that does not benefit the worker. That that further solidifies and subjugates them to the dynamics of class. One. Two, there are people, large proportions of people in the United States, who... Maybe not even the working class, but but thinking about certain parts of the South, Appalachia, individuals in those segments of the population, whether they're, they're working class or they're unemployed, are also living in conditions that are nearly identical to individuals in third world countries. That one article that came out a few years ago about Alabama, there isn't public sewage there. Like there are people who are pumping their waste into holes yeah. near their homes. And they're getting ringworm and the houses are decaying and like it's it's genuinely like terrible yeah, or conditions. They, or they don't have houses. Yeah, there's a lot of that, too. Like I, how many homeless people are there in America? There's like over a half thousand? million. It's big. And focusing on the differences between the American homeless person and the third world country homeless person or worker, whatever the comparison is. How is that helpful? Well, you see, those people are the labor aristocracy, if they're white. Meantime, some white person is literally living in the street. Like, there's a number of pictures of people who are, like, clearly uh, not able to buy food or on drugs, living in, in tents, and they're white, and, like, people quoting it, settlers. Right. And then if you bring race into it in in the American Imperial Corps, do those people benefit from it? Uh, but the thing is, even so, like, accept the fact that there is a comfortable average, uh, average for the worker. Sure. Co- yeah. Thank you. There is a comfortable average condition for the worker. Uh, accept that. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that the American proletariat 
has more in common with the international proletariat than the bourgeoisie of this country. Like, talk to almost anyone about, like, what they think the government is doing. Are they doing a good job? No. Yeah. Why? Because their own personal interests are not being taken care of by the ruling class of this country. And even if they were, that is a form of coercion itself. Yeah. Um, and this brings me back to what was said earlier. What a convenient way to make a movement ineffective is to focus on the differences or saying that people who are also oppressed by a class society are labor aristocracy and your enemies, saying that the American worker is closer to Jeff Bezos or whoever, uh, that's pretty helpful for the ruling class because there will never be any conditions of solidarity or a mass movement when you're one, if you're thinking from an international scope, um, if you're differentiating the American worker from the international proletariat in the context of third world countries, or even at a smaller scale, viewing the labor aristocracy as white people, viewing the white worker as closer to those ruling individuals or the ruling class collectively, instead of the person that works right next to you, uh, the same employment position who has a different skin color than you, that will never work. You will never unionize. You will never organize. You're supposed to be antagonizing each other. Have you ever seen the view where they say unions are a white thing? Yeah. Which that's bullshit. Like the attempt to unionize the Amazon warehouse was in like a, an 80% black area. Just totally absurd. Yeah. Statistically speaking, but ideologically speaking, really disgusting. But all in all... The fundamental thing that this ignores is the, the primary class contradiction. One, just from a, a rudimentary perspective, the interests of the ruling class are obviously diametrically opposed to that of the working class. Socialized production with privatization of profits. So there are workers who are collaboratively working together, but like not having a, an individual investment in the products that they're making, and all of that profit is going to an oligarchical class, that is the fundamental contradiction that makes those interests opposite one another. This settler shit, it, it completely ignores that. The big idea is that you're not going to be able to cut through the propaganda that these folks have been sold. You're not going to be able to pry them away from their refrigerators because that is enough. That is everything that you need. Uh, I don't understand exactly how that mechanic works because I know that, like, despite the fact I'm able to keep food for more than a couple of days, uh, that I have other problems. Having a refrigerator and being able to fill are two separate things. And, Having, and then even if you can fill it, that doesn't mean that your interests are aligned with the ruling class. Yes, exactly. And the idea that these, what are essentially basic things in the United States, are something that we hold over the international proletariat is absurd. In fact, I want everyone to be able to keep food for a few days. I want everybody to be able to have a shower if they want one. Like, Yeah, the, the solution is not to make the American worker conditions worse <laughs> so that they're equal to yeah. the international proletariat. The, the other thing, too, and this is like the patriotism episode that we did before, is I find it so fundamentally strange that in terms of efficacy of a movement, people think that subscription to this idea is going to be effective. And, and well, especially when they racialize it in the United States, like the majority of the population is the labor aristocracy and your enemy. That sounds pretty effective. But in any case, um, the idea that among third worldists or Sakaiists is to make people advocating for the position that we're advocating for to render them racist or fascist apologists or things like that. Imperialism apologists. Imperialism apologists. Why are they more interested in trying to make people look like that or rather than focusing on what 
would be effective. It was ultimately a lot like that tweet that was saying, like, um, to clarify what anarchists want to burn. And this was a pro-anarchism post. What? It was a very, it was a list of three things they don't want to burn. I don't remember what they were. Libraries was one of them. Hospitals, but, maybe? Hospitals, I think. Yeah, hospitals, libraries, and maybe one other thing. But under the things that they wanted to burn, it was like museums, schools. Like the third thing on the list was logging trucks. Oh, They had prisons. They had, I think, state buildings. And then logging trucks. Yeah. And it's like, I, I understand those things from their ideological viewpoint. Logging trucks, however. Well, I think that's like you're, you're contributing. Those are primary contributors to, to <laughs> deforestation. Sure, but like as the third thing on the list. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're going to do that, you might as well put the fucking plastic straw factory. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The problem of this, though, it's so similar to the problem of acting as though the American proletariat is somehow the beneficiary of imperialism and the, the pure problem of this. Like propose this to any normal person who isn't indoctrinated to your ideology. And they're going to be like, you want to burn down schools? You guys have to understand the, the context of people who post this kind of thing. Either way, like we, we could talk about this from like a, a political st- perspective. Like you think about this longer than three seconds. Oh, how fucking stupid. Um, that's dumb. Um, you don't even have to go that far, though. You can also just go like the LARPing route and say, like some people have said, um, None of you have nor ever will burn anything down in your life. Yeah. <laughs> like the kind of people that write that stuff. I mean, Chaz was just the city letting a bunch of stupid kids <laughs> sleep in the road. The other thing that's interesting about this, too, and kind of reveals that it's a fetishization of America as a uniquely bad place is that all of these conversations are focused on American workers benefiting from the Imperial Corps. You don't hear people saying that about Western Europe. You don't hear them saying it about Australia or Japan um, or or other wealthier nations in East Asia or South Asia. It's, It's just the American worker is uniquely bad. And while the United States have a unique role the United States it is not the sole construct of the imperial core. So it, to me, that reveals that this argument is almost purely based on aesthetic of what's really hip now among self-identifying communists, which is to hate America mm-hmm. and the American worker. And again, it completely ignores the fundamental class contradiction. Yeah, the main differences are in class. They're not in where you live. They're not in your race. They're not in what part of the world you're from. Even if we're talking about means and averages and those places are poorer, class isn't an income-based thing. Mm -hmm. Class isn't uh, like, are you at the refrigerator level? Are you at the plumbing level thing? It's a relationship to the means of production. The whole idea is to act as though the American worker is elevated so far beyond everyone else that it is just it's fundamentally impossible that they could have any revolutionary potential that they could ever band together and understand that their interests are actually at odds with capital in the state. Now, the luxuries that supposedly make the American working class the beneficiaries of imperialism are an example of nurturing dependence. We are being dentists by the ruling class in the United States of America. The dentist system is at play. Genuinely, I'm not saying that as a joke. It's really, we are being dentists. Um, the dentist system, for those who don't know, is Dennis from Always Sunny in Philadelphia's method for picking up girls. It's his name, each letter is a step, and you follow that, and supposedly this, this amazing system We'll get you all the girls you could ever want. D, we demonstrate value. E, engage physically. N, nurture dependence. N, neglect emotionally. I, inspire hope. And S, separate entirely. You're probably already thinking, wow, that actually kind of does sound like what the U.S. state is doing to us. I can prove it. And I will. D, demonstrate value. The post-war economy following World War II. The economy expands 
at an incredible rate. Wow, what value. American capitalism, it's a success, man. Engage physically. The baby boom requires no explanation how that's engaged <laughs> physically. <laughs> N, nurturing dependence. The 1960s, Medicare, social programs, civil rights, things that show that the U.S. state is looking out for you. They care. And their interests are aligned with you. Yeah. The ruling class state interests are aligned with you. Second N, neglect emotionally. The 1980s and onward, austerity. Reaganomics, uh, yeah. trickle-down economics. NAFTA. Yeah. The exporting of labor. Everything that a millennial has seen over the course of their lives. I, inspire hope. Barack Hussein Obama. And Bernie Sanders. And, and, Bernie, and that yeah. whole thing. That whole thing that we all did when we thought that like politics was good. Yeah. Yeah, that whole... Like, we were like, oh my God, something's happening. Yeah. It didn't. But Obama, particularly, in that his message was explicitly a totally empty hope. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, separate entirely the stage we are currently at, the degrowth movement. You're not going to own anything, and you're going to love it. Overconsumption is happening. You guys need to cool it. You Americans, you <laughs> beneficiaries of imperialism, you need to consume less because fuck you. Get back in your pod. Come live in the pod. Trump kind of did a Mac move in after completion. <laughs> he did. Oh, that's my system. The Mac. Move in after completion. You're not wrong. I wait till you're done with him, and then I swoop in, give him a shoulder to cry on, and then we hump. That refrigerator is just nurturing dependence, though. Like, yeah, you get to keep food more than a few days. And as I said, I think that everybody should be able to do that. But... Given that you are one of apparently a few in the world who can, it's a scarce resource that you must compete with the rest of the world for, which does the work that you have repeatedly outlined during the course of this episode of separating the American worker from everyone else, both internally and externally, in the American worker's mind and in the mind of the others. But once again, to return to the final analysis, the American worker is not fundamentally at odds with the work of the international proletariat. And to think that is a fatalist, pessimistic, terrible view. You're basically saying, don't try to do anything because it's not possible. And that's not what we're about here. We're not about that. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching or listening. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.